We can start now. Okay, good afternoon everyone. What an amazing couple of days. And it's our absolute pleasure to bring you this um, closing keynote. So we did actually set out a framework for this a while ago, but also over the last two days, we've been adopting it, um, adapting it based on what we've been listening to and what we've been learning here, because that seems like a good thing to do with a closing keynote rather than just some random thing appearing. Um, many years ago, my dad was a pilot. He said the interesting bits were the takeoff and the landing but on this particular flight over the last two days everything has been really quite interesting and we've had a really good time actually. It is my absolute privilege and pleasure to introduce you to Cass Potter. Cass and I have been working together since last summer um, and um, this year we decided to celebrate my birthday um, that we would just set up our own company then. Um, yay! And uh, it's been really helpful because Cass has been able to explain to me many of the, the things that I didn't know about myself and what I've been trying to do for the last 20 years. So my special interest is continued improvement. Um, I really, really like people, kind of in the anthropological, studying you like ants sort of a way, the autistic way. But you know, it's, it's fun for me and apparently it's okay with most of you. So that, that, that works, okay. Um, and when I sort of explained to Cass my career path and being a transport planner and a civil engineer and everything I've been doing, she sort of said, well, Emma, this all fits together. I was like, what? It's coherent? It's congruent? I did not expect this to happen. But it turns out the things that we do and the things that I've loved my whole, well, my childhood and my, and my um, adult life actually do fit together and they do make sense. And there's a possibility, a real, genuine, actual possibility that for the first time in my life, I might be in the right place at the right time. And that all comes from Cass um, and her very unusual view on the world and her incredible brain but I'm not allowed to say that she's clever um, because she'll just say she's not it's a boring game that we have but she is an absolute genius there Cass Potter thank you very much um and reciprocally I was supposed to introduce Emma but she's already kind of just told you sorry the background. sorry ADHD um, <laughs> so what I will say is Emma's really been doing lean and helping global consulting engineers and construction companies on their lean journey for over 20 years um, and has developed a real niche as a behavioural coach and leadership coach. But I think the final thing I will say about Emma is actually she's really the embodiment of what we're going to talk about today. I hadn't worked for three years after a period of really, really poor mental health where I ended up in a psychiatric unit for six weeks. And then I came out as transgender in October 2021. And the one thing I knew is that I didn't ever want to end up back in hospital again. And I didn't want to work in executive search anymore because that had really contributed to my decline. But I didn't know what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And when an old client of mine introduced me to Emma, she decided in five minutes of speaking that she didn't actually care what my professional background was. She just wanted to work with me. And she's been coach, mentor, business partner, and rapidly second best friend uh, ever since. <laughs> so Dr. Emma Langman. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, Cass had over 15 years working in executive um, search. And one of the things that p few people last asked for was much of what's in within here. It's what every industry needs but it's not what they usually go and, s and search for um, and they certainly don't realize that it actually fits together which is quite quite cool isn't it um, right so over the last couple of days there have been so many inspiring pieces of um, change and storytelling and opportunities to reinvent ourselves, reinvent our teams, reinvent our organisations. And this morning's keynote, I'm really glad I hadn't put my mascara on because, you know, actually we have an opportunity to change our communities and do some really cool stuff together. Um, and Margaret Mead is one of my very many heroes. Um, and she said, you know, never doubt the... the what a small group of people can do to change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has done that. And that this is a relatively small group of, of people. But this morning's keynote is really sticking, sticking in my mind that actually it is about 8 billion of us and it's a community of 8 billion of us. 
Um, so anyway, we thought we'd start there. And we'll at the end, we'll tell you about something small that we're trying to do ch to change the world as well. Um, yes, OK, moving on. So in this talk, we've got three questions. So the first question is basically, what, what have we learned here today? Because sometimes you go to a conference, it's wonderful, and you see your friends, and oh, it feels great, and you just feel fantastic. And then you go to work, and you say, oh, went to this amazing con, and they're not really very interested. Oh. Right, so it's a bit like going for a really long walk with a really muddy dog on a really bad day and getting home and having a bath and then getting out of the bath and going on another long muddy walk, right? That can, it can feel a bit like that. So actually what's important is what we do with what we've learned. So we want to reflect today on what have we all been learning over the last couple of days? So what? What does that mean for us? What's the meaning we're going to make from it? And then what are we going to do with it? And from Geordie, right yesterday, you know, that, that move to action and, and getting something done is really, really important. OK, so that's what we're doing here this afternoon. Cass. Yeah, so as Emma's mentioned, really, there are a number of threads that have just repeated themselves through the last two days really in terms of the storytelling element, the importance of being able to communicate and connect across shared experiences, not just experiences as well, but feelings. You know, we are an increasingly diverse but small world that still has a lot of challenges ahead of it in terms of how to integrate and genuinely collaborate. And that human connection is really fundamental in that. And then, of course, there's a room full of really incredible brains when it comes to the tools and techniques and methodologies in terms of organisational structure and planning and really integrating and really understanding how to execute the strategy and the vision and that idealised design piece. And then there's been a whole role about the importance of leadership and about coaches and mentors. And those three recurrent themes are really the crux of what we're going to talk about, almost as if we know what we're doing. <laughs> Well, we can all just sort of pretend together, can't we? Thank you. So, um, Cass, would you like to tell us just, I know you started a little bit around your story about change, but the inevitability of change, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So, probably most of you will be familiar with uh, the pain pleasure principle of Freud. And again, um, Kubert's keynote this morning very much talked about the marginalization and how the world doesn't work for a great many people and the world of work doesn't work for a great many people and, and we can talk all we want about organizational structure and tools and processes and everything else but we have to recognize that for an awful lot of people work and personal life is a place where they sit in a pain space and what we need to do personally professionally ethically um, in terms of achieving lean outcomes is help people move away from that pace, place of pain and towards a place of pleasure. Um, and as Deming said, and Emma's a huge fan of dead white men. Yeah. Um, I, I, like some, I like some living white men also and some dead people of other characteristics. But um, it seems that structurally white men had more support getting books written. Yeah. Unbelievably. Yeah. Um, but Deming notably said um, one of the key takeaways that everyone is entitled to joy at work. The joy in work. Um, and hopefully that's what we're going to start to help you navigate your way through in terms of how to achieve that and what the barriers are and where realistically we sit at the moment. So um, I am a fan of, of dead white men. Um, Cass is a groupie of this guy. I wouldn't say groupie. But she made me watch is, it. She made he, me watch the whole thing. I want to be sick the whole way yeah. through. So for those of you who don't know, this is Alex Honnold. Um, he's probably the most famous free soloist on the planet. Certainly one of a fairly small cohort who's done it for that long and is still alive. Um, and he's the only person to have ever free soloed El Capitan. And I don't think anyone else, frankly, is stupid enough to try it. Um, and people have remarked many times on whether his brain chemistry is completely different. He had an MRI scan to try and work out why he doesn't feel fear. And the reality is he does, but he's learned to manage it 
and he's learned to control it. And by executing and learning and developing and constantly being on a growth mindset and trying to achieve the pinnacle achievement, he's learned those tools and techniques and got to the point where something to us, when you look at the magnitude of that, I think two and a half thousand feet without a rope, just climbing boots and a bag of chalk, would seem just a preposterous thing to do. But for Alex Honnold, it was simply about executing actions and his trust in himself was such that he just literally woke up one morning after lots of prep and went, today's the day. And four hours later, he was at the top. So, um, yeah, bravery is probably one of the, the key themes as well that's come through from, from these couple of days um, through all the speakers. So, in order to achieve things, we have to trust ourselves, but we also have to trust each other. Um, the trust equation is quite a famous thing, really, um, and it's about the different elements of trust. And it freaks me out how, much, how often we're with clients and they, they don't actually know what trust is. So, they say, oh, we need to, we need to, need to trust each other. We say, okay, so how do you do that then? Uh, well, what, what is trust? What are the elements of trust? And then you show them this and they get quite excited because it's, it's an equation and we mainly work in engineering. Um, so trust is really about credible. So do you know your stuff? Do you, do, have you got the competence and the skills and everything else? Then also about being reliable. So do you do what you say you were going to do? Do you deliver when you say you're going to deliver? And so much of that has come through in these last two two days around predictability and, and delivering the backlog and sprints achieving what you expect them to achieve and all that sort of thing. Or, or managing expectation if it's not going to happen. And then the third thing is, I mean, I appreciate we're in London, so it's a really uncomfortable thing to say, but um, <coughs> intimacy, right? Intimacy. Um, so actually just getting to know each other as human beings and having a conversation and, and maybe, you know, even liking each other a bit or tolerating each other or, or whatever um, seems work appropriate. But actually that intimacy is really important and um, yeah, that's key. And the last one is self-orientation or maybe selfishness. So like we might like somebody more or less and we might think that they are competent and capable and we might think that they will deliver what they say they're going to deliver. But if we think that they're basically trying to get one over on us, right and we smell that then then the trust disappears immediately and that's one of the reasons obviously why shared goals and shared missions is so important because then it's not about my interest or your interest it's about our interest in achieving that together so that's really a key part i think we think of why scrums and things like that are really important because you're focusing on those same goals and being clear about that um of course trust isn't all that easy really um, because when we don't know someone very well um, we're not likely to trust them and if we don't trust them we don't really want to spend time with them and if we don't want to spend time with them then we're not going to get to know them and so on and so forth and you end up with more and more tribes and division and suspicion and I mean it's a it's obviously it's a it's a campaign strategy if you're in politics but other than that it's, it's not brilliant, really, for us as members of society. This is the work of Barry Oshry, by the way, who is also one of my favourite dead white men. Um, it just is, right? Um, and we'll come back to, all right, so that's the what's. So what, what are, you, what are we going to do about that? Okay. They are Barry, name checked. So in a second, by the way, you're going to have to wake up and do something as well because so far you're all being sort of nice and supportive and now you've actually you're gonna actually actually do something Cass we've got a long way to go yeah so we're all f familiar with the uh, sort of Reaganomic model and this idea that if you created wealth it would trickle down and everything would magically be all right and people would be walking around dancing in showers of dollar bills um, and of course that didn't happen um, while that economic model and application uh, arrested the recession, it also massively increased uh, the equity gap um, and made... In fact, I saw an amazing thing on Twitter the other day where someone had posted that during COVID, the richest people in the world had increased their wealth by something like 3.7 billion um, and your average worker aggregated 
was 3.9 billion worse off, almost as if there was some kind of correlation. <laughs> um, and having been involved in predominantly diversity and inclusion work for quite a while now, and obviously for obvious reasons that I'll explain if anyone's being really kind, uh, it lands quite personally with me nowadays. DEI strategy very, very often follows a similar model. We'll train our C-suite and our executive leadership on diversity and inclusion, and we'll run them through some training about the Equality Act and some protected characteristics. And magically, lo and behold, their organisations will become diverse and magical, wonderful places for everyone to work. And it doesn't work. So representation at board level is really, really important. Visibility is really important, and that does trickle down to effect. But training and teaching people how to collabor collaborate, how to integrate, how to be not sexist, racist pigs, does not magically flow down. Um, and nor does the creation of employee network groups where you have, you're the LGBT group, so you go over into that corner over there and you talk to each other about life, while all the people who cause you harassment on a day-to-day -day basis will carry on with their jobs and never learn anything from you. And you'll be in your little echo chamber and you'll also be unpaid EDI interns on top of your day job. So traditional DEI strategy just doesn't work. And what particularly doesn't work is a drive towards diversity targets with no framework and real effort around creating inclusion. And in fact, all the research says that if you do diversity without doing inclusion, you actually get a negative impact on productivity. Almost as if just throwing loads of different people together and doing nothing to teach them how to get on would be a bad idea. Strange. OK, thank you. Um, so please get out your mobile phones if you haven't already been um, doing whatever you've been doing, Candy Crush or whatever you've been up to. That's very out now, isn't it? I, I'm into Royal Match. That's my happy place. And it doesn't look like the advert, even though the advert says it will look like the advert. Close brackets. End of ADHD sidebar. Right. Um, <laughs> So if you could please click on that, or if your QR code reader isn't working, then you can go to the mentee. Uh, we're going to have a very brief competition. Okay. Woohoo! Here it goes. So, question one. Oh, they, here they come, here they come, here they come. Everyone lining up, jostling for position. Are you ready? Right. Six. No. Well, hurry up then. Yeah. Ah. Oh. You're stuck. Mm. You're not stuck, you're unstuck. Look at the speed of this feedback. It's amazing. Right, okay. Red. Some people have gone in and gone, nah. Oh, oh. Very good. Very. Right. Right, we're going to go. So let's start the quiz. Okay. The faster your finger, the more points you will get. What percentage of women in tech said they have not experienced gender discrimination at work? This is a 2022 survey. Women in tech who have not discri had discrimination at work. Vote, 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 vote. Fingers on buzzers. Everyone's voted, right, okay. So, the li oops, that should give me the answer there. There we are, 7%. It's both terrifying that that's an awful statistic and that you guessed it. But, so, yay, that's where we are as an industry. Woo! At least we, at least we know how bad we are. Okay, so um, here we go. Here's the leaderboard. Ooh, we've got some neck and neck stuff. Nigel, that's not the same Nigel. Is he just on a winning streak? Nigel, it's your day. Are you going to buy a lottery ticket on the way home? Absolutely, one for everyone. Right, okay. So, next question. The next question is, bum, bum, bum. what percentage of LGBTQ plus people in the UK have experienced a hate crime or incident in the last 12 months? By the way, knowing what the acronym stands for, it, it isn't really allyship. All right, just... <sighs> Can you not remember? Oh, they keep adding things, don't they, Cass? That's what it is, yeah. It's alphabet soup. Okay, yeah. One in five. Um, so, so you're, 
You're really beating the odds on this one, because how many of you had two in the last... Uh, I've been assaulted three times in the last six months. Six months, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because if you haven't got anything else to do and you're walking down the street and you see someone who looks different, obviously a fun hobby is just to spit at them. That's, that's a great thing to do. Okay. Right. Leaderboard. Ooh, it's moving around. Okay. Okay, here we go. Joe, where's Joe? Joe, there we go. It's one of those weird things, isn't it? It's exciting to be winning, but it's such an awful set of statistics. Yeah, sort of conflicting. Okay, right. Um, cool, next one up. Going crazy now. Not all of these are even going to be uh, protected characteristics by law, right? Some of these you can do. You can legally discriminate in some of these ways. Woohoo! You went wrong. Were you not paying attention? Okay. What percentage of managers admit to being uncomfortable hiring neurodiverse employees? About half. <coughs> uh, self awareness problem. Okay. Roughly half. Ooh. Oh, you thought they'd lie. Yeah. Uh, probably it was an anonymous survey or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. We sh sh yeah. We assume that they won't have told the truth. Right. All right. Next one. Do -do -do. Fingers on buzzers. Right. What percentage of black women feel valued at work in the UK? Okay. One in three. Okay. Question five. Flash through. Yep. So ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. So things like your parents being divorced, a parent going to prison, spending time in care, a uh, parent with mental health issues, um, physical disability, being a carer for a parent, those sorts of things. Most people have at least one. Which means I'm being the odds right now. <laughs> yeah. On average, people with that many adverse childhood experiences will die 20 years younger. And all the time that people are dealing with this stuff, many of them are trying to hold down jobs in your organisation. In fact, many of these people are you. Okay, David. Yes. We found our resident expert on discrimination. <laughs> we spotted each other immediately. Yeah, we all sat together on Sunday night. We're like, oh, you look really messed up. You're our tribe. Ah, yeah, it's good. Okay. And last but not least. Wait for a couple more players. Dum, do, 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 do. Right. <clears throat> What percentage of carers so that you could be looking after an elderly parent, looking after a child, perhaps even trying to hold down a job at the same time? What percentage of people in that position have poor physical or mental health? Oops. 71%. 71%. Okay. Now, as we sit here and reflect on those figures and everything else, we'll notice that some of those will have hit home, either us personally, or someone in our family, or someone in our team, or, you know, so this is, this is for all of us, this stuff. And one of our key specialisms is um, doing DEI stuff with straight white blokes without making them feel like they're to blame. Especially middle-aged straight white blokes, they're our proper niche. Especially middle-aged straight white engineering blokes, they're like... <laughs> That's very, very ace that. Because it's hard to feel like you might be part of the problem or to recognise, oh, I've, I've got privilege, I've got bias. And actually, what we're going to do after we've seen who's won this very sad quiz, 
Mr. Crow. Thank you. He doesn't want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, last final question for you, please. How do you feel now you know this information? You've got up to three replies. Um, unmoved, maybe? Ambivalent, I don't know. In David's case, smug. Smug, <laughs> he doesn't, look. Oh, mean. Yeah, later, yeah, later when, yeah, yeah. <sighs> Public humility, private <coughs> arrogance. <laughs> yeah. You're not as modest as I am, I'm telling you what, I'm one of the most modest people I've ever met. Yeah, and just while those are coming up, you know, the sobering thing is there, there's almost no limit to the statistics that we could have pulled to put up there. And they're all things that your line managers, colleagues, peers, business partners, friends, families will have going on in the background. And many of them bear no protection under employment law. They're not covered under the Equality Act, but they will be things that will severely impact on those people's ability to um, always perform at work, to balance work and home life. Um, I, I mean, another one that really, really staggers a lot of the the people that, that we work with, who, as Emma said, predominantly straight white men, there are currently 13 million women. Um, it's a third of the entire female population going through perimenopause or menopause. Uh, it's estimated that a million every year will leave their jobs because of the lack of support. Um, and up to 25% are considering le leaving their jobs because of the lack of support. So when we talk about identifying waste, that's a huge, huge waste. When we have such critical skill shortages, shortages in many sectors too. Yay! It's always good to finish an event on a high, isn't it? Okay, right. Thank Keep it light, guys. All right, uh, one second. Okay. By the way, I have to toggle because we're a start off and I'm just too tight to buy the version of Menti that means you don't have to toggle. <laughs> right, okay. So, so what? So we have some emotions around this. Um, I noticed one of the words up there was cynical. You're welcome to come and chat to us. We'll show you this thing called research papers. Um, because it is real and, and it is our lived, lived experience, all of our lived experience, it impacts on all of us in one way or another. We um, had a retreat a few, a few weeks ago and uh, one of the line managers was absolutely devastated because male line manager realised that the women in his team <clears throat> not only had more than a 50% chance of being sexually assaulted in the workplace, but the chance of being assaulted by her own line manager, not him, but statistically. 20%. Uh, 20%, 20%, by your own line manager. So it, it is real and it is present and it's, it's a bit rubbish. So what? Okay, well... I am an engineer originally, so here goes. The important thing then, if we want to change things, is to actually be able to make things move with the amount of effort and energy that we have. And what that actually means is, scientifically speaking, and this is all to do with moments, obviously, um, <laughs> you need to make sure that the fulcrum is close to the load. What that means is the place where you're pivoting in, in order to put your effort in the right place needs to be the place where the, where the problem is. OK, so that you can have the maximum impact for the minimum amount of effort. And um, you, you, you might not be, but I find that we find that people in uh, lean and agile and stuff like that often tend to be intrinsically lazy. We are anyway. Um, so we want to have the most bang for our buck. And also we're not going to live forever and there's a hell of a lot of work to be done. There's a hell of a lot of change to happen. So we need to put that lever in the right place. OK. And that place, well, yeah. Yeah, so now, now we really come to the how. So how do we make this change happen? As I said earlier, top-down diversity doesn't work. And that's the reality because people's experience, how it feels to work in an organisation, won't be the organisational values. It won't be what the website says about how they value 
people. It will be their experience with their line manager. And organisationally, in a like pyramid hierarchical structure, that will mean that those first line people, managers, early to mid management level people are where the change really, really needs to happen and where that trust and that connection and the trust equation is really, really important. And a lot of it stems, which is a term that we've heard many times over the last couple of days, from actually creating a place of psychological safety, making people feel that they can speak up without being belittled, that they can, can contribute ideas and then they're not going to be dismissed as the junior and what do you know, you've only been in the industry 12 months, and whatever it is, and making them feel that they can genuinely belong. So how do we do that? Well, what's the side part? There's an input and there's an output. A lot of it's actually about leadership development and leadership behaviour. Um, and we'll come to the science around that shortly. But good leadership development and behaviour that's really nurturing, supportive, but also really clear in the objectives can really foster that psychological safety, which creates that sense of inclusion. So what next? Where do we go from there? Well, that's the starting process of deliberately developing your climate, having a climate that's by design, not by accident. I think it's probably worth just saying very briefly, Cass, what climate is. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> very often we talk about organisational culture, which is basically how we do things around here our mission statement, our values, our modus operandi. But as I said, what really, really lands, particularly from a talent management perspective, is the organisational climate, which is how it feels to work here, which again circles back to that thing about connecting around emotions and feelings and lived experience and storytelling. And what happens when you get inclusion? Well, you get diversity of thought, you get diversity of background, you get teams that are multicultural, where there's gender equity, where there's representation. We work in engineering. You know, we, we're, des we're designing societal infrastructure, but the designers don't represent the societies they're designing for. So how can you design accurately and adequately? So you get that diversity of thought, and then you get the missing link to becoming a learning organisation, which is, hey, Lean Agile, improvement and innovation. And the biggest choke point of improvement and innovation, particularly in our industry, is the exceptionalism of people saying, ah, we've done it this way for 30 years. And there's a lack of new ideas and new thinking and new perspective. And the beautiful thing about this is that when you fed through that loop and you become a learning organisation, you can then say, Where's the improvement opportunity? How can we further improve our leadership development to create a feedback loop and a continual learning loop? So um, all that's to go back to what I said at the beginning about when I met Cass, which was I thought I was a bit, I mean, I am wired up unusually but um i thought i was really strange because i love i do love like a good process map and um i will set myself long division puzzles for fun and i've been doing that since i was about eight and they really said oh i think she might be autistic but anyway it's um i really love doing that but i also love the psychology and trying to understand how people work and how to help people feel good and um how for me to feel good and them feel good and you know that whole trust equation and how and how does it work like how how does this all this human stuff work it's quite complicated i think maybe maybe you've got it nailed but all well, the risk of relationship stuff and things is um a bit tricky and then after my my divorce i had um complete breakdown and i was in the wrong part of the world at the time and it was all really messy um and i sort of was really on my uppers in so much as um as I ever would have been, because I have a very, very lucky family. So even if we'd been homeless, we'd have never been ruthless. You know, we'd have always had somewhere safe. So I recognised, even in that moment, I had such a lot of privilege. Um, but it was like, well, how on earth does this all fit together? I need this to fit together. I need the pieces to fit together and for the jigsaw to add up and for me to be in the right place and to be able to say things and not be made redundant because I'm a 24-year-old saying to the board that probably they ought to actually live their values. And apparently you're not meant to say things like that to CEOs, right? It's not, especially when there's a round of redundancy going around, it's not, it's not the thing to do. Um, 
and that's why when it's been such a relief for me to meet Cass and ha and for her to help me to understand myself and how all of these things actually fit together because it's all it's all just so I've always thought it was the same thing, but um, no, I couldn't articulate it, and she's much better at articulating that than I can, than I am. So yeah, you have to have that wider system of um, safety, and then in terms of the leadership. So in the talk this afternoon, last talk about Ukraine, there was a piece about moving from servant leadership to directive leadership. Servant leadership is directive. Servant leadership serves a goal, right? It's not about being, it's not about being pathetic. It's not about being weak in any, any way. It's serving a goal. And what's really important is to be able to get things done and simultaneously care about people. I know that happened ages ago. I'm just going to try not to fall over. To be honest, I'm not really enjoying the whole shoe experience. It's a bit rubbish. Um, there we go. That's better. Oh, thank goodness for that. <laughs> Shoes are awful. Anyway, um, so that whole um, getting things done and caring about people at the same time, it's really difficult. And by the way, you can't just do what I try to do my whole career, which is um, get really cross. Oh, angry, right? JFDI, how many times have I have to explain this, especially if you've got a social communication problem. I've told you over and over and over <laughs> to do this thing. And then it hasn't happened. And then everyone's like, oh, all right, fine. And then they go off and do something. And then, and then I would feel really bad. And then I'd be like, so I, I bought pizzas? Um, that doesn't work. So swinging between JFDI and then being lovely doesn't work. But also, being lovely is really ineffective. Awful. Having a boss that doesn't know where they're going and isn't leading you anywhere and not knowing what's the point is, is absolutely useless. It's a waste of time and money and intellect and everything else. Um, and then there's also the place, uh, I think this came up in one of the sessions you went to, didn't it? Where another thing that people do is just disappear altogether all and they're not there at all. And we, we really liked the name of that category of person, didn't we? That was... Uh, it's really cool when you're in a room and you're part of the LGBTQ community and one of the characteristics and names that's given to a type of characteristic is Stonewall. That's, that's really cool. I know, exactly, David. It's, it's amazing. It's a riot, yeah. It's a riot, yeah. Ah, moving on. Okay. So that's really important. Do those two things together. Um, and when people work in a good climate, they are more productive. So Cass was saying about climate earlier. And this is proper research because numbers, you know. Um, ICI started doing this in about the 70s and 80s where they were trying to work out what made the difference between different teams and their effectiveness and how well things working. And basically, they looked at the age of the plant, they looked at the processes, they looked at the quality of supply, materials, everything else that was coming through, looked at it as a proper system. Because ICI was a system, a really good system, viable system, in fact, until it was broken up by people that didn't understand variation and variety. But anyway, that's another story. Um, and uh, put that there. Um, and so what they actually discovered is real data showing that when leaders behave in that way, that bit where we need to get stuff done and simultaneously I care about you, genuinely care about you. For the average leader does that about 48%, 48% of the time. If you do that 75% of the time, i.e. if you care about getting things done and give clarity to your people and care about them 75% of the time and 25% of the time you're a bit rubbish, you would still be world class. Isn't that amazing? You could be rubbish one day in four and still be world class, right? So it's attainable is what I'm saying, okay? Um, and so for every 10% change between that 48% average and 75% world class, how it felt to be in that team, how safe it felt to give ideas and take part and challenge and do all of those other things, that increases by around 20%, which results in up to 40% improvement in pretty much any statistic. It was a chemical industry, so they were looking at safety, but you can pretty much put any KPI against it, productivity or profit or whatever. Um, and it holds true, which is quite cool. But this is owned by somebody who's a very independent thinker who isn't very good at sharing ideas and stuff. So, so we thought that two people who find it a little bit hard to communicate socially should bring it to market more. <laughs> so, uh, so that's what we're trying. Anyway, so now what? 
you've been here, you've heard this, we've had our warning about time. Now what are you going to do? And this is the moment to move yourselves to action. Okay, so whatever emotion you felt around those slides, other than cynicism, which is not an emotion, but anyway, we'll get to that another time. Um, we would like you to invite you to action. So where to start, Cass? So we are on a strict time warning now. So this is a representation of intersectionality. All of those aspects that form really important parts of our identity that might need to be understood at work. And one of the problems with DEI training at the moment, and this is, by the way, no means an exhaustive list that really demonstrates all of the things that could be privileged or make people marginalised or underrepresented. Um, the problem with DEI training is it attempts to teach managers to understand all of these characteristics. And it's just not going to happen. It's kind of fourth bridge territory. So we need to forget that and we need to stop thinking that we can educate everyone about every aspect of identity, particularly when the reality is most of us will hit several points on that wheel. Yeah, so if you imagine you've got certain protected characteristics, you're going to be really busy going to, to those um, engagement groups at work, aren't you? So if you're a carer and you have a physical disability and you're part of the LGBTQI plus community and uh, you're never going to get any work done, are you? And why are you carrying the load that for something that's already a bit harder? Okay, so you can't just cheap people through things. So what do we do? The key is intersectionality. Cass. Absolutely. So intersectionality was a term coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, who was a civil rights advocate. Um, the what case that's always cited is General Motors versus de Graff and Reed, um, which in a nutshell was where an employment tribunal was thrown out because although the black women at that plant had clearly been discriminated uh, on a last in first out policy when that plant had never employed black women previous to 1964, the judge made a decision that combining a new, well, forming a new type of prejudice out of the intersection of race and sex would open Pandora's box. So he threw their case out. And Kimberly Crenshaw was outraged at that, looked at a number of cases, and gave rise to intersectional theory, which is simply the notion that we are all comprised of many different identities and sometimes the intersection of those identities causes specific challenges. And also, when you meet somebody who has got a shared characteristic with you, they're still different. <laughs> so, you know, I know it's amazing, isn't it? Not every agile or lean practitioner is the same, not every Ukrainian is the same, not every gay person is the same. How amazing, we're all actually unique. But then, how we can't sheep dip people through training, so what on earth do we do? So, the first thing is easy, get people to spend time together. So we don't trust each other because we don't spend time with each other, so we don't know each other, so we don't trust each other. So, biggest job you can do, which is exactly what you do, is exactly what you do, is getting people to spend time together. So Barry Oshry's work was, you know, we spend time together, we get to know each other, we get to trust each other better. It, it's so... It's really, that's where we start. And um, also just a word around spending time with people who are different to you. And um, we play, we invented this new game um, walking down the South Bank last night, which um, Cass was getting a lot of unwelcome attention. I reckon they were just checking out your tattoos, but apparently she reckons it could have been other factors. Um, so we were walking along and we, I started to play this game where I counted the number of people that didn't give her a strange look. And we got up to, and this is pretty good, so London, we're going to do it all around the world. Well, may, maybe not Saudi. Um, 19. 19 is London's best streak of uh, people in a row that didn't give um, Cass a strange look. So anyway... What that also means is people feel uncomfortable, they feel they might get something wrong, they might say something wrong and we accidentally other people because we don't want to put our foot in it and be offensive or whatever. Um, but actually there are really simple tools and techniques for being able to do this really well and loads of them come from Lean and Agile, like there are tools. Thank goodness for that. Okay, so Johari's window, um, we've heard that a few times over the last couple of days but getting to know each other, understanding our masks and our blind spots. And we are all faking it to some extent or other. 
we are all faking it to some extent or other and we all know what it feels like to not quite fit in or that might have happened at primary school or high school or somewhere but we've all had that experience so although the cause of that experience might be different we understand it and we can connect around that empathy of experience that's to say the mask we're wearing might be different but the experience of looking through that mask is similar and of wearing one is similar so we do all sorts of things um learning social practices where's chris, oh, chris is gone <laughs> Well, anyway, I was making this really nice link to his stuff. Um, but yeah, social practices, so time out of times and looking at social webs and 360s and all sorts of really cool things that we can do. So, Cass. And the important thing, like everything, can we talk about, um, we talked about that ignition time and, and translating from ideas to action. The important part is the beauty of this system is it actually doesn't ma matter where you start in the model. But for goodness sake, start somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Work on the psychological safety. Encourage diversity of thought. Really improve through self-reflection and professional development your leadership behaviours and your leadership ab abilities um, so that we foster that inclusion, so that we drive that improvement and innovation and so that we become learning organisations um, and, and growth active mindset individuals and then finally um because things are a system and uh, things are connected to other things the yeah 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 joy and work etc is is really important but that's a means to an end for us so Cass and I this year will we will establish the Bakerfish Foundation which is about um supporting families through the loss of a child because that's really awful because you know how your family fits together and then there's this big hole in it that really oughtn't to be there and then how do you adapt and cope with that and so um so there's this really clear vision which i'm not very good at visions generally but this one keeps sticking it in our heads um around retreat centers where families can go so it's like the opposite of a ronald mcdonald house you can go after losing a child and spend time together and heal and meet other families in that position and yeah, that's our kind of little thing, that maybe some big thing for some people that um, that we need to do, we have to do. So that's everything. Um, so take 20 seconds. What have you learnt from the two days or from this talk? And what does that mean for you? And now, what are you going to do about it? Obviously, connect with us on LinkedIn is like right up there, but um, what are you going to do about it? So just take a moment or two, if you wouldn't mind, to reflect. If you would like to come on one of our retreats, we will run one. We do them on the pool basis, because that works. <laughs> uh, and our retreats are really great for those people who think they're part of the problem and want to be a part of the solution, but are really scared of it. Um, because as Emma says, what we do really is sneak the diversity and inclusion work in like vegetables and kids' pasta. Um, <laughs> So we teach them loads of really cool lean tools and teach them how to do collaborative fish planning, bone analysis, and fish bones and all that bit of sort of stuff. Pareto charting, and yeah. And then we accidentally, from their eyes, teach them how not to be racist as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is great. Everyone's a winner. Yeah, it's lovely actually. Okay, so thank you very much, and we've had found it a real privilege to talk to you. And uh, I never know how to end these things because I can't do social communication very well. But cheers. <laughs> thank you. I'm proposing an action, given the speed, um, about menopausal issue. I think um, men can help, okay? So I can speak openly, because my wife, she's trying to solve the problem. She was in a menopausal situation, and thanks to the hormone replacement uh, therapy, she's back as she was before. So my action is proposal for every uh, family, especially if you're a man, and even if you're not affected directly or indirectly, write a letter to your GP and ask a written answer. Is your practice proposing proactively hormone replace therapy? 
they are due to give you a written answer. And if they reply, no, we don't, no, we are lying, NHS is not providing, have a conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yeah, I got through an awful lot of antidepressants. <laughs> and it turns out, yeah, oestrogen would have been more helpful. Anyway, you lives and you learns. I don't know anything about hormone therapy. <laughs> Uh, any more questions? Anything else? Comments, feedback, nothing? All right, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.